Hello, I'm Dagny Zhu, Medical Director at Envision Eye Centers in Roland Heights, California. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Elizabeth Yu from Virginia Eye Consultants. She is Medical Director at CVP Mid-Atlantic Surgery Center, Assistant Professor at Eastern Virginia Medical School, and President of the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. She practices in Norfolk, Virginia. So welcome, Dr. Yu. Dr. Zhu, thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be a guest on your show. Oh my gosh, it's an honor to have you and to learn from you, as always. So today we'll be discussing the latest on phacal emulsification, fluidics, ultrasound, and phacal dynamics. So let's get right to it. So Dr. Yu, how has cataract surgery technology evolved over the last several years? Sure. It's so interesting. Um, talking about this topic, I mean, I, I date myself a little bit, but um, I first trained on the legacy. So that was doing residency training from 2004 to 2007. And the jump between the legacy to the infinity in terms of phacal fluidics and the dynamics there, what a huge leap that we took in terms of the stability of the anterior chamber and just Adding torsional technology really was a game changer with how we were able to better manage the nucleus and to have that AC um, have like better or less bounce of the chamber, of course, but better stability and safety overall. So we were seeing clearer corneas, even as a younger surgeon um, and newer surgeon, having done less than hundred cataracts, we really could feel like, wow, we're getting these great results with shorter cataract surgery times, not feeling nearly the discomfort or the anxiety that I could see my senior surgeons um, experience as residents who were senior to me because they trained, you know, on different systems than I did. Now let's fast forward a few decades. There's obviously peristaltic based fluidics where you do kind of depend on that vacuum and full occlusion versus uh, venturi based systems where it's more fluid pushed and it's vacuum independent. And certainly I have seen, wow, what a wealth of, where I used to say that there's definitely a key favorite. And while my actual ambulatory surgery center is mostly a centurion uh, type of, most of the ORs have centurions, which are truly, I mean, it is just like it was kind of a leap from going from the legacy to the infinity. I thought the infinity couldn't get better, right? But it really did with the, with the uh, I'm sorry, to the infinity, but then from the infinity to the centurion, what another leap there was in terms of even better stability and feeling like there was a level of like almost a Maserati effect, but there are truly the phacal fluidics of the modern systems are so fantastic. Um, looking at the Quatera and the dual pump or the multiple pump systems there, or like the Venturi system, specifically being a hybrid system that allows me to utilize either a Venturi uh, pump for like the IA. So all the viscoelastic can come out just while sitting in the center of the eye. Or if I want to be more in peristaltic in like a chop setting where I want to go after and have that full occlusion or quadrant setting where I may just want to sit in the center and have the pieces come to me, but I can go back and forth with a, uh, with a hybrid pump uh, system such as the, um, the actual uh, Veritas. Uh, so there are these different types of cataract systems versus the Stellaris, which I used to absolutely utilize all the time um, when I was at a different ASC. And I absolutely uh, love the different systems because they've all advanced in different ways that have increased in safety, providing excellent clear corneas. And now we even have a system that is without ultrasound power, utilizing the micor, utilizing mechanical agitation that disperses no heat. And that's a really interesting way to do cataract surgeries. And certainly it really has maximized efficiency um, without utilizing heat. And that's been very special too. Wow, you've covered such a wonderful evolution of our fake emulsification technology and we've really come so far. I kind of picked up where you left off in training. I got in with the infinity and like you, I was like, this is so good. How could we make it even better? But a lot of the, the newer technologies like the Centurion, I think what really takes it to the next level is maintaining that anterior chamber stability with just 
better and more sensors. You know, you've got sensors that are um, detecting the flow and the IOP constantly, and you can constantly adjust the inflow of fluid to maintain that stability so that you can operate at higher powers, higher vacuums, and perform more effective and efficient cataract surgery. Um, one of the things that I really like about my Centurion is the active sensory in the handpiece. So they actually have a sensor in the handpiece itself that is constantly monitoring uh, flow or chamber stability. And so I think ultimately we're going to get to that point where we can operate at even higher vacuum for better efficiency, but more safety <laughs> because anterior chamber uh, stability is maintained while also be able, being able to do so at lower IOP. So I think there's a new push towards that. I don't know if you've heard about that, Liz, whether we could be doing a better job by just operating at lower IOP so that we maximize you know, blood flow to important tissues in the eye. And also maybe it could help lower uh, patient discomfort during surgery, because I certainly know a lot of my patients tend to jump when they feel that change in IOP. And then maybe even less corneal edema and even you know improving more uh, our outcomes on day one. I love the way you put that because you know, I think that we've come so far in terms of safety. And I think you would agree even with efficiency. Now we're taking it to, you know, exponentially, and we're talking about the patient experience, right? And you're absolutely right. There is something unique about the active century that I didn't believe that we really could go down from an IOP of 55, let's say, right? And really bring it down to 35 to 40 and feel like I had the same level of minimal post-occlusion surge, you know, maximizing that chamber stability with minimal iris movement, because I don't like to see any blotting of the iris at all. And then now that I do see that with that you the new active century, which has been available to us, but the more and more you utilize it and the more refined that they have actually uh, been able to take my actual settings to take that IOP lower and lower to a nice level, patient comfort really now matches my efficiency. And I don't have to worry about the surge or the potential lack of inflow that matches, you know, to match my outflow. And it really does do a great job at that. And I really have been able to notice that there is less of the reverse pupillary block. There's none of that concern or the, oh, the sudden jump where the patient suddenly wakes up and is feeling the discomfort after they're in that pseudophaco state or aphaco state. And we're just taking out the viscoelastic because that's when patients can kind of experience it most often or right when you're entering the eye. So absolutely these subtle, these subtle changes changes make massive improvements to the patient experience, as well as the, the, the intraoperative journey. I think we've come a long way, not only in terms of efficiency, but maximizing the patient's experience, as you mentioned. Um, I definitely know my myopes, you know, with the, the, the long eyes, the deep chambers, they get a lot of bouncing that causes stretching of the ciliary nerves. And so they really benefit from having that anterior chamber stability, as well as those, you know, patients with pseudo exfoliation, right? Those zonules are already loose. You want to maintain that pressure as much as you can so you don't have vitreous coming forward. Um, and I think we've done a lot with post-occlusion surge. It's something that you don't see or fear as often as before. And there's some of, you know, some of the less fancier changes that have improved that, including changes to the tubing. Right. So the less compliant the tubing, the more rigid it is, the smaller the diameter, the less likely you are to have post occlusion surge because you're keeping uh, inflow within the eye and less outflow. Um, what are some other uh, advances that you've seen, Liz, that have kind of decreased your complication rate? Sure. Um, great uh, questions. And thoughts there because not only have I seen, as you've mentioned, that you know we are doing what we can to notice the little nuances within the eye. We're seeing less shimmering of the iris, for example, even with actually having hand control with my micor, which is the actual non-ultrasound energy or mechanical agitation um, disassembly of the nucleus. I've also noticed that while it's in its first generation of post-commercial launch, so it is in its earlier stages, even in its earlier stages, so I can't 
uh, control it where I can move from stage to stage on my own. Um, so that will come, the automation part of it. But the disassembly of the nucleus, it's so impressive that I can do that. But the hand is quicker than the foot. So, uh, and the needle, it's not a sharp needle. The tip is blunt. And so there is the safety part there, as well as the chamber stability, it's not only anterior chamber stability that I'm seeing. What I never realized was, wow, there's also a capsule stability that is something I didn't account for before, which I see a little bit more of with my micor unit that I never thought about before. So the capsule, which I only, I do see flutter more so with dense lenses or when there is more loose annuals, but the micro flutter often does occur. Um, and I didn't recognize that that is another level of chamber stability that I do appreciate in more cases. So I can go a little deeper and maybe some of that might be because I also know it's a blunt tip. So some of that pseudo confidence comes with the kind of the extra confidence knowing that it's a blunt tip. And so there is a much more reduced chance of me damaging anything plus the fact that there is this nice anterior chamber stability. But to your point, also, it's it's nice knowing that we do have more rigid tubing that provides that extra anterior chamber stability as well. Ultimately, it will be unique for us to see in combination this plus different devices that we utilize, maybe like if we're considering like, for example, like Zepto technology or other technologies where there is multifunctionality, right, where we can combine a femto laser that might be able to perform a MIGS or at the time of cataract surgery or perform an automated capsulotomy or robotics, like as we start to combine fecal emulsification units to some of these other units, that's where I feel like from a generational standpoint, we'll start to take things to another level because I feel like we're getting close to hitting, now we're doing more nuanced things to sophisticate our FACO technology. Um, I think in order for us to become more disruptive, we'll either move towards non-ultrasound like the MyCore and advance that, or we will start to combine and create multifunctionality with other technologies. Awesome, Liz, that was such a great discussion about how we've been able to improve safety and outcomes, especially in terms of reducing uh, ultrasound energy. So that MyCore technology sounds really cool. I saw a video of it and it's awesome that you can take down a three plus dense nuclear cataract without any ultrasound. So I really think that is where we're headed and where we'll continue to head. So one technology that we do have now, obviously, is the femtosecond laser, which allows to, to decrease some of the uh, ultrasound energy needed to break down cataracts. Um, what are your thoughts on femtosecond laser technology and what sort of advantages does it provide us over standard ultrasound bagel classification alone? For myself, I absolutely love utilizing the femtosecond laser in my hands. I think where we are in its current iteration, and yes, we're about 10 years out since the first introduction of femtosecond laser, the software upgrades and where we're at does improve our precision and accuracy and the safety of the PIs have made it such that it really does help us and the, the actual side effects or the potential complication profile is so, so low. And the fact that we can use the preoperative information and each system is a little bit different, but we can upload information, albeit whether it's the Cassini or the Varion and uploading into the different femtolaser systems and whether it's tabs within the actual capsule itself or onto the cornea itself, that information that allows us to identify the steep meridian, for example, make a perfectly well-centered capsulotomy, even use that digital intraoperative OCT to grade the density of the lens, to break up the lens so much more effectively than it used to. All those benefits 
plus that nice capsulotomy size that does provide that great overlap to prevent IOL tilt and then alignment of my IOL and centration. It really, all of those lends itself to providing a more efficient and more precise outcome afterwards. And it certainly doesn't hurt that I'm not inducing any greater high order operations by having you know the capsule not covering part of the lens and inducing coma or tilt. And that's so important with any practice that has a higher volume of utilizing diffractive lenses or presbyopia correction. And we certainly don't want any undue outcomes, especially with astigmatism correction. So for me, I do think it is really important considering when we see those anteriorly placed annuals, that happens not infrequently. And I really think that manual capsule rexus in those cases, and I see that sunflower appearing anteriorly placed annuals, I would say one in 10 cataracts, much more surprising now that I'm looking, you know, so to have the capsulotomy actually creating that versus me pulling, tugging on all of those annuals, even in, and that's completely separate from those patients who already have loose annuals or propensity for loose annuals, or those, you know, who have um, prior trauma where I know that they're a little bit dislocated or decentered in terms of missing annuals. These are all scenarios where I therapeutically think femtosecond laser is superior, but it certainly is helpful in a lot of scenarios, not just from a therapeutic standpoint, but certainly from a refractive outcome standpoint. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I do quite a bit of uh, refractive cataract surgery and, you know, patients are expecting premium outcomes. And so I find that the femtosecond laser is wonderful at getting you to that outcome that they're expecting. So I often use femtoarcuates to correct low levels of stigmatism. And you're absolutely right with premium IOLs. I really think there's a benefit to centrating that capsulotomy over the visual axis so that you have you know, complete uniform 360 overlap of the IOL, because over time there could be tilts, right? If you don't have that complete overlap and it's something that I still need to study, but I think in these premium eyes, it's the small things can make a big difference. And I also think that, you know, now with Torg IOLs, you know, you have all these technologies where you no longer have to mark the eye, you can use iris registration. So again, you're getting that precision that you wouldn't otherwise be getting. But even with those routine cases or non-premium cases, I've found that the femto FC has saved me from a lot of potential complications. Uh, for a lot, sorry, I have found that the femto has saved me from a lot of potential complications, like the ones that you have mentioned, Liz, with gusanuals, but also small pupil cases. You know, I haven't really had to use an iris ring or iris hooks in a long time because I can get away with using that femto create a capsulotomy in those small borderline pupil cases. And I think in the future. I am optimistic that femtosecond laser technology will continue to improve as we continue to add on these bells and whistles to optimize our premium outcomes, but also even for routine cases, like I think we'll be better able to use BACO energy to disassemble denser nuclei and perhaps show a significant decrease in the amount of energy that we have to use um, when we're combining the femto imaging with some of the fecal emulsification. We're seeing more of that technology, that dual technology, and I think that will uh, will translate into better outcomes um, because I think a lot of the studies are sort of uh, currently, you know, we can't really say that femto actually does decrease um, fecal ultrasound energy use, but at least for a lot of my cases, the two plus cases, I can often um, rely on the femto disassembly to remove the lenses without using any ultrasound energy. But it would be nice to see that in more routine, um, a little denser cases as well. I agree with you. I think that current in the iteration of looking at like, let's say if we were to look at the last three years of cases and did more moderate to dense cataracts, they would, there would be, I can say with certainty that what it does to soften the nucleus and what my dissipated energy is, is so much lower than five to 10 years ago and using the femtosecond laser. So there is definite improvement in the software, in the in how the patterns have improved in what we're doing. So I certainly think that, that the literature, there's always a little bit of a lag. So I think we will see that into the future. Or I'm praying because I think there is a superior but again, this is anecdotal. The peer review literature is a little bit controversial there still, but a lot of that was based on, you know, the earlier generations of Femto. Yeah, that's a great point. And I hope to see that. Hopefully you'll be contributing to that body of research as well. So Liz, we're 
kind of wrapping up sort of what our uh, techniques are for um, improving safety and efficiency of cataract surgery, what are some special techniques or instruments that you like to use in the OR that helps you achieve the best possible outcomes for your cataract patients? Uh, let's see. So <laughs> something simple that I know that I always do, which is such a simple pearl for everybody, but I think not having to think about it at all. And luckily we're still fortunate to be able to do this, but compounded sugar epi or epi sugar cane for every single patient. So I don't even have to think about it. But in addition, I would love for us to move into more and more of a dropless type of cataract surgery. But in that vein, anybody that I see preoperatively that's five millimeters, or smaller. I mean, if they're smaller than four, then I'm already saying that they're at high risk that I'm probably going to be utilizing a malugan. Um, so I'll just say high alert malugan ring or pupil stretch, beeler or something like that. But if they're five to six millimeters, I'm always calling for Midria to be uh, available to me so that they can have that um, at the time of surgery. Um, but uh, for me, you know, I love being able to you know, for me, I think a quick chop is an ideal way to take care of uh, the more dense nuclei, but certainly having the my loop has been such a game changer for super dense lenses. So those are, you know, some of the basic things within our toolkit uh, for making sure that we are being able to better manage these complex, but your more routine complex cases. This isn't your out of the bell-shaped curve of what you may be experiencing or managing on the daily. This is something that we can, as surgeons now, more readily take care of and not worry about these eyes having serious complications because we have these kind of tools that take these, uh-oh, potentially bad cases that could go really awry, but then put them in the realm of, wow, this is something that we can do on any given day. Um, and for myself, I always write impossible. I prep them for a possible anterior vitrectomy for especially for any of those who have the loose annuals or super mature cataracts, just so that I remind myself that this is a uh-oh type of case. And that usually is almost like my good luck charm to prevent myself from running into that trouble. Yeah, I would say extra patient counseling is always a, uh, a, a necessary or a, a cherry on top in terms of what additional technique we could do to improve your outcome. It's just setting those realistic expectations. Nothing fancy there, but I think always welcome and helpful. So thank you so much, Dr. Yu, for the excellent discussion. And thank you all for listening. Please remember to take the post-test and evaluation to receive CME credit and tune in for additional episodes within the podcast series.